last week you were, you know, just sitting around at home, just enjoying the cool inside temperatures while it was 100 degrees outside. Um, but uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll dive into things tonight. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for being with us here tonight and allowing us to have this study this summer. We just pray, Father, that you bless uh, the time together as we uh, pause to, to talk about these uh, important aspects, Lord. And, uh, Father, we just pray that uh, as we look forward to uh, completing this material, that, that you'd really um, round out our understanding here, Father, of uh, understanding how to truly interpret the Scripture. So we thank you, Father, for your many blessings, and pray that you bless tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a different twist. If you have third edition, turn to the first chapter. Third edition, turn to the first chapter, which is uh, Bible translations. And we're going to spend about half an hour uh, dealing with the Bible translation section, and then we'll go to word studies after that. So just uh, keep that in mind uh, as we go through this. Bible translations um, are varied, as you know. And uh, in your book, in your textbook, um, incidentally, is there anybody here tonight that needs a textbook? If you don't have a textbook at all, you want it. There's a textbook on the back table in the auditorium that someone left there with a note saying, let someone use this. So if you don't have a textbook tonight, you want to go get one, you want to just follow along tonight, take it home, whatever you want to do, you can feel free to do that, all right? So we have second edition where you're supposed to be. The second edition, I'm on page 157. And I'm doing the second, I'm teaching from the second edition tonight because I had just too many notes to go back to the third edition and recopy everything. So I'm in the second edition. I've looked it over fairly carefully, I think, so I should be able to, to match things up pretty well. So when you stop and think about the Bible translations, and uh, he starts off, you know, you're going to go buy a Bible, you walk into a Christian bookstore. I'm not sure if people do that anymore. Um, it is pretty helpful, though, to, to be able to do that and to be able to look through all of the different uh, translations that are out there. Uh, there's huge differences, obviously, between uh, Bible versions and Bible translations. Uh, some Bibles uh, don't have uh, any helps. There's no footnotes, hardly. Uh, I should say that there's a few footnotes in this Bible. This is the Bible that I use to um, preach from. There's a few Bible maps, but not very much. And there's no study notes uh, in this Bible. The Bible that I read... Uh, the rest of the week, however, is loaded. It's this thick, and that might be what you have. I see a study Bible there. You can tell a study Bible a mile away, can't you? Uh, you look at it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a study Bible. So we have to depend upon the translations that we have in order to be able to, to really be successful uh, with this because we do not know the original languages that the scriptures were written in. At least I'm going to assume that you don't know Greek and you don't know Hebrew and Aramaic. You may, um, but if you don't, you'll need a translation. So when we think of a translation, uh, we think of the English translation that we have, there is a, a lot of history that backs up um, our English translations. Uh, how did we get our English Bible? Who wrote the Bible? Um, that's a great question, right? Um, and he says, kids ask the toughest theological questions at supper one evening right after hearing a Bible story in the lower on a story of the Tower of Babel. Megan Duvall, that's the author's daughter, five years old, asked, Dad, who wrote the Bible? Uh, what a great question. Megan's question is part of a larger question. How did we get our English Bible? And so uh, does anybody know? How did, how did we get our English Bible? Uh, how, did, how did we arrive at uh, the English Bible that we have? Okay, it was translated from Greek, the English. That's true. That's, that's true. There's a lot of history that goes into it. How did we even determine what books of the Bible were inspired? You'll notice there on your chart there uh, that you have the divine author, who is God, passing it down to the human author. And uh, whether it's uh, Old Testament or New Testament, it's a human author who is moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And that... From that human author comes the words that God superintended to, to give to him, and we have the original text of Scripture, all right, the original text of Scripture. And what was the original text of Scripture written on? Papyrus. Papyrus. 
papyrus, and, and you're going to, to write uh, very carefully with that, and as it expanded, you had to put another piece of uh, papyrus next to it, and eventually you rolled it all up, and, and you had to, to bring it all out. Um, how did they determine, for instance, how, how did they determine which books of the Bible uh, would be inspired and would be kept, and others were not? Who, who decided that? What, what was the decision-making process? Council, I see it. Uh, that had a bearing on it, but there were certain foundational principles that uh, you don't want to look through. I mean, I, the council had kind of gone over some of the things that had been part of the speculation and made some final decisions, but even before that, let me give you five, uh, five principles. One was the book written by a prophet of God. It couldn't just be written by some hack, right? I mean, like me. <laughs> it just, it, that, that just wouldn't fly. So it wasn't written by a prophet of God. Number two was the writer confirmed by acts of God. When you think of the Old Testament prophets and you think of the apostles, one thing that stands out among them was the things that they were able to do. Uh, they were able to perform miracles, many of them, and, uh, and so they were authenticated. Just as we talk about Jesus doing the miracles, it authenticated him as the messenger and the message of the gospel, right? So those, those miracles played a role. And so the prophets who were instrumental in giving us the scriptures were also uh, authenticated in a way by the things that they did as well. Did the message tell the truth about God? Great question, right? Uh, God cannot contradict himself, and he cannot lie. So the church fathers rejected any book uh, that had any type of false uh, comments uh, about God. Um, they had uh, the policy, if it's in doubt, throw it out, basically. Okay, so there was a, a consistency there. Number four, does it come with the power of God? Does it come with the power of God? The church fathers believed the Bible was living and active. You think of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It had transforming power for edification, sanctification, evangelism. And if it didn't have the power to change a life, it was not... It could not be construed then as divinely inspired. You don't realize how powerful the Word of God truly is. But it's easy to put to test another book, like Maccabees, for instance, and you don't see the power of God demonstrated through the teaching of Maccabees. And so you can see uh, pretty clearly where that, that dynamic ends. Was it accepted by the people of God? That's another basic question. But the church fathers considered whether or not a book was accepted by the first believers as scripture, and, uh, and then it became uh, canonical. So the canon, how many have ever heard the term canon? The, the original canon? Okay. Anybody know where that word came from? Where that terminology came from? Anybody? Let's, let's talk about No, it's, it's actually, um, that, that would be... Yeah, I mean, that'd be more believable than what I'm going to tell you, but I'll, 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 I'll tell you the truth, <laughs> and, and you can keep that in, in mind. Um, it's often said the, the Word of God is a sword, but it's not only a sword, it's a cannon. Um, and uh, it's not a, the, the biblical cannon is a wheeled weapon, uh, but cannon, C-A-N-O-N, and C-A-N-N-O-N, and what is a C-A-N-N-O-N? It's a weapon, right? They do share the same root. Uh, and it all begins with a reed that grows alongside of the Nile River. <clears throat> the Greek word for the plant that grows along the side of the, the uh, Nile River was known as a cannon, yeah. right? With a K. And over the centuries, uh, that tubular reed was used to describe tubular weapons. Now, any type of gun is a tubular weapon, right, Charlie? I mean, it's, it's got a tube. There's a barrel there. There's a, there's a cannon. There's a, there's a big tubular <coughs> construct there from which the projectile is going to come out of. Uh, in English, with the extra N picked up from the Italian via the Latin uh, cana, uh, we have the idea that there is something that is a, a tubular weapon that is known then as a cannon. 
and you think about the link between the reed that grows along the Nile River and the cannon barrel, uh, think about it, the Italian terms uh, for tubular pasta, not to make it, everybody eats up, uh, the Italian term for tubular pasta and pastries is what? Cannoli. 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 Exactly. <laughs> You say, oh, okay, yeah, they're tubular, and there's a weapon inside, it's good, right? So you've got cannolis and cannellonis and all of those kind of good things. So the Greeks started to cut those reeds down uh, by the edge of the river, and they, they cut them down into very specific lengths, okay? And they became the rod of measurement. And so those, those tubular reeds were, okay, well, you know, if it's, I, mean, I need a three foot, three foot piece of rope. Oh, well, three foot, let's get that three foot piece of reed out and we'll hold that rope up and then cut it off at the end. Um, you're six feet tall, well, you've got a reed that measures that. And, and so it became a standard of measurement. So in the same way, the authenticity of those books in the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, were referred to as being chemical because they had passed that measurement test. They measured up. Does that, does that make sense? So now you know the whole story behind uh, the, the canon of scripture and uh, you, you can walk down the street knowing something of great importance and great value. And when you go to a restaurant and you get a cannoli, uh, raise it up and thank the Lord for the canon of scripture. And uh, that, that would be awesome. All right. Now notice here in your notes, as, as we kind of go through this a little bit, um, some of the Hebrew uh, manuscripts, um, we, we ask ourselves, what happened to those original autographs? You know, what happened to them? Um, in your notes there, as you might expect in time, people wanted to make copies of the original documents of scripture. Then copies were made of those first copies and so on, and there were, there are over 5,000 pieces, manuscripts, because we're talking about all or parts of, some of them are really small, uh, but we don't have the original autographs because they have no doubt um, absolutely turned to dust uh, and, and they're, they're no more. But in, in 1947, you had the Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testaments discovered in Qumran near the Dead Sea, as you may recall, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain a portion of almost every book of the Old Testament. Prior to the discovery of the scrolls, the oldest Old Testament manuscript dated to the 9th century. In other words, some of the copies found in 1947 were 1,000 years older than the most recent ones. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's just, it's just pretty, uh, pretty incredible. That was an amazing, amazing find. So as you, as you stop and you think of the whole process, um, it's been pretty fascinating as the scriptures have been uh, put into a language that uh, we could have uh, today. It's just fairly amazing, I think, that um, we can have the, the opportunity to go online and look at you know, 25 different translations and have them all right there in the uh, English. Now, textual criticism, you see that in your notes, textual criticism, <coughs> is an analysis or a technical discipline that compares various copies of the biblical text in an effort to determine which is most likely the closest to the original. The work of the textual critics is foundational to the work of Bible translation. The Old Testament, the standard critical text is Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. It is a mouthful, right? And we don't say that very often. Uh, but BHS will do, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but you look at that, and, and you can see, okay, this is the this is built upon the manuscripts that we find that are most reliable. When it comes to the New Testament, you have a couple of uh, different texts, families of texts uh, that we translate from as well. And I'll get into that a little bit more here in a moment. So English translations. Do you have a brief survey of English translations? Early Christian leader, Jerome, he translates into Latin, around 400, it's the Latin Vulgate, and for a thousand years, 
uh, this was the Bible that was used. You think of the Catholic Church, you think of the Catholic Mass, that was in Latin because they were using the Latin Vulgate. And it was, it was pretty much normative. John Wycliffe uh, started to um, work on translating the Bible into English. The Wycliffe Bible is 1380. So it goes from 400 with the Vulgate to Wycliffe's Bible in 1380. And it actually was a word-for-word -word translation from Latin into English rather than from Hebrew into, and Greek into English. So when you go to the Bible Museum, how many have been to the Bible Museum? Okay, about half of you or so. If you get to the Bible Museum, you want to go to that section there that, that has all of the information about the history of the English Bible. Because it's fascinating. And uh, to realize that people, and you'll see there in your notes, in 1536, Tyndall was executed and his body was burned because he had a resolute commitment to Bible translations <coughs> and his desire to make... <coughs> The boy that drives a pile in England know more than more scripture than many a scholar does. Okay, that was his motivation. People didn't like that. Can you imagine getting executed? Why'd you get executed? Well, just translate the Bible and somebody came along and killed me for it. Wow, <laughs> really? Okay, I mean, seriously? Uh, that is pretty amazing. But that is the battle that, um, that raged. Because the question was, are we going to put the English Bible into the hands of common people? You know? And, and it's, it's most fascinating when you stop and you think about it. We have such a prized possession, and we have a prized possession that people's lives were lost over. And yet we won't even spend 15 minutes reading. You know, we, we're too busy, it's, life's too hectic, and so, yeah, I'll pass on another day of reading my Bible. And so why don't we read the Bible if it's so valuable? It's a, a great question. For, for our benefit and for a, a great blessing, God worked in amazing ways to allow this translation to, uh, to take place. The printing press, mid-1400s, there's renewed interest in classical languages associated with the Renaissance, and you had the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s. So the English Bible translation went into high gear. That's when Tyndall produced the English New Testament based on the Greek text rather than the Latin text. That was huge. That was huge. Um, along the way, um, significant developments, Coverdale Bible, entire, entire Bible is translated into English. Um, later on, uh, we have the Geneva Bible in 1560. It was the Bible of Shakespeare, the Bible of the Puritans, the Bible of the Pilgrim Fathers. Um, but it had Calvinistic marginal notes in the Geneva Bible, and the bishops of England were unwilling to use it in English churches. So... If you have a study Bible, how many of you have a study Bible? Okay. You have a study Bible, you have notes. Where'd you get the notes from that? Do you ever wonder where those notes came from? Translator. Well, the person who translated, for instance, the notes um, are, are not part of the original translation. So let's stop and think about it. For instance, I have, uh, I have Dr. Gene Getz's study Bible, he put it out in the Holman Christian Standard Bible version. He had nothing to do with the translation of that version. He just put it in there. And then based upon his own teaching notes, he put the notes in the bottom, and so you had principles to live by and so forth, other things. Every study Bible has a theological bent to it, doesn't it? Yes. Because the notes are outside the, the lines of the scripture. So whoever you get is a study Bible, uh, you are going to trust their notes. For instance, John MacArthur has a study Bible out. Um, you say, well, did he write all those notes? Well, I know for a fact he didn't. Because a friend of mine wrote the notes on Proverbs. And matter of fact, before the John MacArthur study Bible came out, I had the entire set of theological notes on Proverbs. I still have them, and they're worth something, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it was a professor who did that, and so it's very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, you know, someone who's renowned uh, comes out with a study Bible, and their uh, underlings are the ones who put that together, and he approves it after he goes over, of course, and then you have it. So when the Calvinistic um, bent comes out in the Geneva Bible, uh, not everybody thought that was a great idea, and so the... 
King's like, well, no, we're not going to use that. And so he's going to authorize a new Bible uh, uh, translation. And that's where you have the King James uh, Bible coming out, 1611, the authorized version, for instance. That was King James I uh, who authorized that. So that comes out. So from a historical standpoint, you have the, the King James, and that's around for a long time. But it needs some, it needs at times some modification. In fact, if you go back through and you try to read some of the, you know, 1604, 1611, um, you read Bibles that are from the 1500s, like the Geneva Bible. If you ever tried to read it, it's almost impossible to read. And, and I, I can read all right, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but I'm looking at these words and I'm going, what in the world does that mean? Huh? What? And now the straight up King James Bibles that I have at home, I don't find particularly difficult. And most of my Bible memorization and Awana and so forth was all from the King James Bible. Um, and so when you, I had a hard time with UW Sports Camp here last week because the memory verse was Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And it is nothing like I memorized it, all right? And uh, I know the verses, but I couldn't say them the way they were saying them. And I didn't want to because... My mind is only so fragile at this point, you know, so <laughs> I have to, to maintain what I already have. Uh, but, but you get the idea. So, so when you look at the, the King James, um, one of the, the things that's important to note is, is the families of text that came from that particular family. So let me just go on to uh, one of your headlines here with your notes. There, you do have a page there from... 1611 KJV, and you can read that. And Isaac spake unto Abraham. <coughs> What's a spake? Um, you get the idea. English translations since 1611, so since the King James, English Revised Version was the first such uh, revision, first English translation to make use of modern principles. As a result, the Greek text underlying the ERV was different from that of the King James. In 1901, scholars produced their own version, the revision, American Standard Version. Some of these were really bad. The Revised Standard Version, for instance, back in the 1950s, was very poor translation. You'll note there that, and I love this, it says the goal of the RSV translators was to capture the best of modern scholarship regarding the meaning of scriptures and to express that meaning in English designed for public and private worship, the same qualities that have given the KJV such a high standard. They all say the same thing, every translator. We want to give this the best, most clearest, wonderful translation, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And some of them just really were not very good. New American Standard Bible uh, claimed to be a revision of the ASV, but it really was a, a whole new translation. And it adheres closely to the form of the original languages. Then the New King James Version came out. and. The interesting thing about the New King James is it retains the same underlying Greek text that the translators of the original KJV used, commonly called the Texas Receptus. How many of you have ever heard of the Texas Receptus? Okay, a few of you have. Texas Receptus, that's, that's basically then kind of the deal breaker uh, when it comes to uh, many who hold that the King James is the only truly inspired Bible version, all right? And so, um, you know, I, I know people who are, who we would term as King James only, and the, the only, you know, version that they're going to use, and they believe that that is absolutely inspired. Let me say this, that there is no translation that is inspired. The only things that were inspired, and I, when I say only, understand how I, I make that, because it's very significant, but the original autographs are inspired by God. And everything else we have done as humans in trying to copy it and trying to accurately portray it. And so it's important to notice uh, that what we're about is not one family of texts. We're about finding the most accurate manuscripts that you can find. And the older the better. Would we agree? The older the better because it's closer to the original source. And so it's it's more advantageous for us to be able to, to really focus in on that. So that's a, a huge, uh, I think, of huge importance uh, to, to all of us here with this. So uh, again, you have a lot of different things that are, are flying out. Good News Bible, the American Bible Society came out with a Good News Bible. You probably remember that. That was 1976. And uh, that was a paraphrase. 
that really wasn't um, uh, a word for word translation. The New International Version came out in 73 to 78, and they tried to produce a translation in international English offering kind of a middle of the road type of approach where it's um, not altogether word for word, it's more of a dynamic equivalent. And that's, that's kind of what it's uh, you know, maybe best to be understood as. New Living Translation, the NLT, uh, it's a fresh thought for thought translation based on the popular paraphrase, the Living Bible. Remember the Living Bible. Uh, many of those are not altogether that accurate. Message is another one. Um, and I know, you know, there's different ones that are using the message. It claims to be a translation, but when you read it, it's really much more of a paraphrase. The today's New International Version is an attempt to revise the NIV. Uh, and they went gender neutral with the NIV uh, not too long ago. And I know the big uh, Christian bookstore, Lifeway, of the Southern Baptist, stopped carrying all of the NIVs because of that. And the NIV, um, at least I, I haven't really paid attention to, to tell you this absolutely or not, but when they first came out with their new gender neutral translation, they said they would not even be offering for sale the original NIVs. And so the only NIV you can buy today is one that's gender neutral. Uh, that was, I, I read that in a written statement that was official from them. Have they changed that? I couldn't answer that. <clears throat> Some of the new ones that are coming out, the ESV, English Standard Version, is a word-for-word -word translation. It uses the RSV as a starting point, and it, its goal was to be as literal as possible while maintaining beauty, dignity of expression, and literally, literary excellence. Does anybody have an ESV? Okay, several of you do. That, um, I, I, there's just too many Bible versions in the world for me to read them all. But um, I, from what I've read with that, um, I think it's a great translation. It has some of the, the flow, I think, the poetic flow of the King James um, without having some of that baggage, which I think is, is a good thing. And then the Holman Christian Standard Bible is now um, known as the Christian Standard Bible, just the CSB. And uh, that's what I read on a regular basis. And I've just really kind of picked up on that one. And uh, I'm, I'm enjoying reading that. So there's all of these different ones. NET is kind of a internet Bible um, that you might see from time to time as well. Some Bibles, when you're reading them, have a, a phrase saying, Older manuscripts may omit this, or older manuscripts may add this. Right. What is that referring to? Older and more accurate manuscripts. <laughs> or that, how are you supposed to uh, read into that? So, so here's an example: <clears throat> the passage of scripture where Jesus is talking to the crowd, and there's a woman taken in adultery, mm -hmm. and he's writing something on the ground, right? And he says, you know, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And you'll see an asterisk next to that, and it will say, older manuscripts omit this. Okay? And as you go digging around, I'm not trying to shake you up and get you, you know, paranoid here. But as you dig around, you find that the more trustworthy, older manuscripts do not have that contained in there. And it would seem that it was added at some point. All right? So that's why those footnotes are worthy of your inspection. They, they are, they're, they're worthy of that. And I had someone not that long ago ask me about that. They said, you know, well, you know, Kevin, what do you think, is that, is that legit or not, you know? And I said, well, if I'm preaching through that, that's really pretty good preaching. <laughs> I hate to pass that up. <laughs> but my conviction is that, that it was added. So, and there's, there's multiple reasons for that. I, I, we literally could spend two hours on just that question alone because you have to compare literary standards and how, how is, you know, is, is this truly matching up with the literary uh, standard of writing or the style of writing, you know, or does it look a little bit choppier? How are the verbs used, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot that goes into, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of, hmm, was this added, okay? But that's what that asterisk is, is going to tell you. In Mark 16. Yeah, Mark 16 is another one. Yeah. So before you 
handle poisonous snakes. I <laughs> recommend checking that manuscript. <laughs> Might be a reason why some have gone awry and uh, entered pearly gates a little early. Um, but yeah, that's a good point as well. So there's some of those. There's some of those passages, and uh, you know we shouldn't be afraid of being able to take a look and say, okay, you know, what what are these older manuscripts uh, looking like? You know. How about the, uh, the addition to the Lord's Prayer for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever? Is that, uh, I understand that was added on at some point? No? I, I have not thought that myself. Um, at least I wouldn't say that to the same level as these other things. But you'll, you'll see these little, like I say, you'll see those asterisks from time to time. And, uh, and and you can definitely you know go about checking them out. Absolutely. Is it bad if they're added? I mean, things are added. <clears throat> well, there's usually a reason. So mm -hmm. so that's why we say and point out and underscore and highlight the original coffee was inspired by God. So when the man put the pen to the papyrus, this is what God had intended. From then on out, you had sinful human beings. Yeah doing the translation. People that make mistakes, okay? You'd be very thankful that I was not one of the scribes. Right? <laughs> because you know, given to detail, I like to get things done, we're moving on, okay? You know, these guys, these guys were so careful when they would make copies that if they even made one small, and in the Hebrew you have these little, you know, yobes, and, and, and it's like if you mess that up and you put it in there, it wasn't in there, whoosh, 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 weeks worth of work, throw it away. And that was the end of it because you didn't have erasers and all the rest. And so they were so diligent about that. It was just a painstaking method of being able to, to make those kind of copies. But along the way, you also have interjections. We see the interjections more so in our study Bibles where someone has maybe a theological bent uh, to it. You can buy a study Bible that's maybe um, done by a Reformed theologian. Okay, and you're going to get the Reformed notes. You've got uh, Schofield and the Schofield Reference Bible that I kind of cut my teeth on. Um, but Schofield was an attorney. He didn't have a theological degree, as I know it. And uh, he messes up a bunch of places. And the notes are not always as trustworthy, especially in the Old Testament with him. So you just have to keep that kind of, kind of in mind. So it is bad that they added something, to answer your question. Uh, they, their, their role was to copy exactly what the autograph, yeah. original autograph said, and there should be no deviation whatsoever. Yeah. Sure. Now, what would be your, I guess, uh, advice to our young people today with all the different versions that are out there that tend to like the watered down version? Uh, what, what would you recommend would be a stronger Bible to give someone that is a new believer or is starting out? I mean, because there are some. Right. I've gone through the bookstores and I'm sitting there going, really? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I like, uh, there's certain ver versions of translations that I like, and I try to give them those classes, but they tend to go, like I said, to the ones that are just kind of flowery. Yeah. And, right. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you go to a Christian concert, the, they'll come out at halftime and they'll talk about the gospel. They usually use the message. You know, because it's more today's vernacular and that sort of thing. Um, you know, can someone get saved through the message? Sure. Someone can get <coughs> saved to the Douay version that the Catholics translated as well. Because we've led people to the Lord using that, their own Bible version. So, um, but a lot of what I would pay attention to, especially with young people today, is the notes. Okay, the, what, what exactly is in that uh, study Bible? Um, and, and I would look for something that was not a paraphrase. I'd look for something that's not a dynamic equivalent. I mean, those of us who are my age and older, we grew up, we didn't have study Bibles as kids, did we? I mean, we bought a Bible, and we were thrilled with the concordance. And the concordances were poor. First thing you had to do after you bought a Bible was buy a decent <coughs> concordance, right? I mean, and you had three concordances to choose from, right? What, what, what are the three concordances? Strong. Strong's for the strong. Yeah. What was it? No. Nope. Strong's for the strong. Young's for the young. And crudens for the crude. Those are your those are your three translations. But strong's we're going to talk about this in a moment. But 
Um, Strong's was, was the exhaustive concordance. So when you get a, a Strong's concordance, I, I had a couple of them, I don't even know if I still do. They're literally this thick, like this. And they contain every single word in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Every word in the Bible. When it says it's an exhaustive concordance, that's what that means. Yeah. What do I preach from? from the Bible. I use the New American Standard. Oh, New American. <clears throat> yeah. So I've just been doing that, I guess, 14 years now. So And before that, I, I preached from the King James. So, yeah. So I've actually spent more time as a preacher preaching from the King James. But you said that the New King James was better than the King James? Uh, it's, it takes out some of the language um, that was more difficult to understand. Um, however... Uh, the we'll, we'll, let me just get to this because um, we'll, we'll talk about the differences with the New King James and the King James. But I do want to point that out. Look at the approaches to translating God's word. The process of translation is more complicated than it might appear because no two languages interweave with each other word for word. So there's not a 100% um, lineup, for instance. And even the word order is absolutely different in the Greek than it is, for instance, in the English. And he gives an example of Matthew 17, 18 there, and you can read through. And, the, and the, if you were to translate every Greek word, it would look like this. And rebuked it, the Jesus, and came out from him, the demon, and was healed the boy from the hour of that. That would be your word. So now what you have to do is you have to take that and you have to put that into some type of uh, you know, way to understand it. You have to synthesize what's being said there. And so word order is going to differ tremendously. And so that's a, a very important um, point. No two languages are exactly alike. Okay, No two words are exactly alike. <coughs> And so there's going to be variances. Um, sometimes, for instance, the English, um, he uses the example, has an indefinite article, an an or an a, an a. Well, the Greek does not. English adjectives come before the noun they modify. They use the same definite article. In Hebrew, however, adjectives come after the noun they modify. So there's just a whole lot of, of differences with regard to this. And, and the difference, for instance, uh, don't make any mistake about it. Hebrew is very, very different than Greek. Very, very different. Uh, they're not similar at all. Uh, so you have a lot of um, difficulties uh, with that. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so for people who are stronger in the Greek, I would prefer to go to the Septuagint and look at the Septuagint that I would go into the Hebrew, but that's um, that's just me. Uh, when you when you stop and you think about it, I, I remember a missionary who um, a missionary who would do a translation work, and this might seem funny to you because of the, the, the things we're talking about. But uh, this missionary, he'd come back and he'd give a report. And he'd say, "Well, you know, the translation work's going pretty well, you know." And finally, I asked him. I said. So, so what exactly is your translation work like? He would write his missionary letters. This is back before people had computers, so bear with me a little bit. It wasn't that long. It was like early 90s. And he would handwrite his missionary letter, and it looked like someone in the fifth grade was doing it. He couldn't spell. He was, the you know, punctuation was all messed up. It just didn't read well. But he was doing translation work. And he was translating uh, into a country's particular language. And I said, oh, do you know the original? I mean, are you going from the Greek into this language? And he said, oh, no, I'm just going from the English into that country's language, which would give them something if they have nothing. Uh, I, I, I grant you that it would give them something. But as far as being accurate and the fact that he had not a real handle on even English, I was struggling with understanding how that was being flushed out to these poor people. I mean, I'm reading his letters and I'm not getting it. And that's English to an English, <laughs> you know. 
And, uh, but you can see that if you're really going to do translation work, you really have to have a commanding understanding of the original language. You can have a commanding understanding of Hebrew, and your focus might be on translation of the Hebrew Old Testament and not the Greek New Testament. And Whitecliffe translators and so forth that are doing that today, people are very specialized. They're doing the work in one particular language most of the time, and, and they're developing that. So the reason why it's so important is if you go from, for instance, English into Spanish, there's not 100% correlation there. And if you're trying to go from Greek to English to Spanish, that adds another layer that's very difficult as well. You're better off, if you're going to be accurate, going from the Greek into whatever language it is that you want to end up in. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you know, just you know, kind of keep that, um, keep that in mind. There's two main approaches uh, to translation. One is the formal approach, and the other is the functional approach. Thought for thought, and in reality, I like that he says this, in reality, no translation is 100% one way or 100% the other way. There is definitely carryover, but it depends on more formal, more functional, that sort of thing. And he mentions the New American Standard um, and the NET Bible using a much more formal approach. Formal translations, I think, um, are, are easier to smooth out and make understandable for the congregation than to take something that is much more just functional and try to bear down on that and make that, uh, you know, just building off of something like that. It's just, I think it's just easier coming from the more formal approach. The reason why I run, use the New American Standard is because of the translation of the verbs. Translation of the verbs in New American Standard is really the best out of all the translations. And I remember my Greek professor telling me, look, if you, the verbs are what drive the language, and that's the best translation for verbs. So that's what you want to use. And I think he was correct uh, with that. Does everybody see the um, little graph, so to speak, where it says more formal and more functional? So you've got the King James and the Authorized Standard Version on the more formal side. New American Standard is one in. New King James, ESV, they all kind of line up. That's a handy little tool there for you to look at and say, okay, so where does my Bible version fall in all of this? More functional. What's the most functional there on your, on your chart? The message, right? So that's much more of a, I mean, that's even more paraphrased than the New Living Translation. So you, you want to keep that in mind because a lot of these are just uh, nothing more than a, a paraphrase. There's comparisons here uh, with regard to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You can actually look through them, and you can actually see how the different translations kind of, uh, kind of play out. But going here to choosing a translation, you have that, and then it goes through. It gives you some comparisons. Choose a translation that uses modern English. That's, I think, very, very important. Um, we mentioned the Biblia Hebraic, the Student Garcian, that uh, is the Hebrew translation uh, that is the Masoretic text, which is the, the main one. And then in the New Testament, you have the Textus Receptus. And then on the other side of it, you have the Alexandrian family of texts, which includes like the Nestle texts and so forth. Most all the translations are going to use the Alexandrian texts versus the Texas Receptus. The only text, the Texas Receptus is going to be uh, the King James and the New King James. So there's a, different, there's a different family of manuscripts there. You want to be aware of that. So even if you want something that's a newer version and you go with the King James, the New King James versus the New American Standard, say, well, you say, well, they're both, they're both uh, more, more modern. That's true. But they're coming out of different families of texts. And so you, you'll find that there's a pretty strong difference at times with the New King James and the New American Standard. Because again, the, the families of texts are different. The King James only people believe that Erasmus is, is like amazing person. And uh, 
you know, he had so much to do with all of that. And uh, that's the only, the Texas Receptus is the only manuscripts that are trustworthy and inspired. And they look at the others as being uninspired. I wouldn't go that far on either side. I would say that they're just, they're different. And uh, they're not so different that anything's unworthy. It's just that they're different. Okay, so any questions? Yep, I had a question about the comment. I think number two about choosing translation yep. um, is so important because when I started to read the Bible seriously, uh, I was reading the NIV and the NLT. And I'm not saying they're bad translations, it's just if you want more formal, you don't go in that route. My point is, as a new as a new believer trying to figure out what I wanted to read, that number two is so important because it's based on the Greek and the Hebrew. And that's when you get the question of people coming up to you saying, well, the Bible is just a translation of a translation of a translation, so it's really not something you can rely on. And that's where they're ignorant and they don't understand that that's not the case. Because those translations that I use the NASB because I find it easier to read and the ESV to study out of, um, that's my preference. Um, I think number two is so key because that then you can tell that person, well, Ours comes from the Greek and Hebrew, and what better source to get your Bible from, from the Greek and the Hebrew? Uh, it would be like me translating into Japanese and then using Japanese to translate into another language and thinking I'm going to get the context correct. It's not. Yeah. It's totally not going to work. I've had that before. People ask me, well, how can you believe my Bible? It's just been translated a million times. Well, no, that's not the case. They don't understand that. Number two, and then choosing translation is, is important. Yeah. That was just what I personally have come across with people. And they want to like knock you down right away because oh you can't you can't use that that's not you know, that's not good that's not going to be reliable okay do you know where your Bible comes from well you know it's just a trend. they don't understand that yeah. and that's where the ignorance comes from but that that's when you read that and said the Greek and Hebrew is what I I just thought was important that everybody really got that hit home because that's the important part of it yeah I think anyway, so. and I would definitely lean towards a more formal. Uh, translation than a functional one. But the nice thing about it, if, if you're doing some teaching, uh, say for instance you're teaching children and you wanted to look at another translation that may uh, just assist you with getting the concept across, there's nothing wrong with doing that. So you might look at something from uh, the New American Standard and you're trying to teach a, a kid's lesson and they might be struggling with that, and you might go to something that is more of a dynamic equivalent, like I say, just to make the point. This is what the such and such says, and bring that out. It wouldn't be heresy to do that, all right? And so um, just you know, keep that in mind. Yep? If you have limited budget, limited space, and limited intelligence, <laughs> what, and you want to study deeper, what, what, are, what main things would you have? Like I read here like a Hebrew to English dictionary and a Greek to English. You want a, con a, a concordance, a Bob or Bible dictionary? What, like, can you just make a tell us a simple list of books you should have? So, um, here's a book here, and, and this is out of print probably at this point in life, but obtainable uh, through Logos and some other things, and obtainable on Amazon.com. So, Weiss Word Studies, and I'll just read the headliner to this. It's Ephesians and Colossians in the Greek New Testament for the English reader, okay? It's for the English reader. So you don't have to be a Greek student to be able to, to glean from this. These are excellent. These are excellent. So there's a set of, set of those for each, like that's for two books of the Bible? Or yeah, yeah. It's W-E, I can't see that. W-U-E-S-T-S. Weiss Word Studies. And I just brought that as just a little bit of an example. This is probably 19, uh, it probably is older than me. I was, you know, I would hope. Oh, yeah. 1953. Older than me. So, my little shh. <laughs> so, but you have to, you have to watch. Like, for instance, this is, this is called, um, when I was in seminary, TDNT, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. I've always wanted a set of these, 
and they were always way too expensive. I could never get it. And the CBD catalog came out, what, a year ago? And these babies were on sale, and it was like within my financial reach. It was like 50 bucks. And it was like amazing. This was like $400 when I came out of school. So what's so neat about this, but if this isn't going to help you. That's my point. This has got a Greek word, and you could look up the Greek word, um, but just to give you an, a little bit of insight, you look up the Greek word, it'll tell you how it's used in classical Greek, secular uh, applications. It'll break it down. This is how this Greek word is used uh, by Paul. This is how he's used in uh, Johannine scripture. This is how it's used by Peter and so you have forth. You the Greek word. You can't start with the English word. No, this starts with the Greek word. Yeah, well, that's big. Yeah, and uh, that, that's why it doesn't, it doesn't really help you. No, uh, not the me. Theological word book of the Old Testament. It's the similar application here where you have a Hebrew word, then it gives you English, and it describes in English, okay? Those are the kind of tools, but you have to have the original languages. So when we come to the section, because our, our next section here tonight is talking about word studies, doing a word study based upon uh, the English language is uh, sometimes tricky uh, because a lot of it, and I guess you can go to your lesson here, um, chapter 8 in the second version, probably chapter 9, and yes. yeah, word, page 163, all right. So when you go to look up when you go to look up words and you're trying to, to figure out, okay, I, I want to do a word study. Uh, how do I how do I find that that Hebrew word? How am I able to do that? It's it's very difficult, you know, to honestly to honestly do that. I would recommend relying more so on a good commentary. You know, a good commentary. And remember, commentaries come out in layers. They come out in layers. If your mother or grandmother had Ironsides commentary, okay? You ever seen that? Yeah. Those Ironsides commentary are nothing more than devotionals. That's really what they are. They're just very, I mean, they're, they're deeper than the daily breads, but they're not too much deeper. And, and so they're very devotional. So there's just layers of commentaries. So I can get his commentary, for instance, on Hebrews, and I can look at, I can look through that, and then I can get one that's a little bit more technical, and I can go right on up to the point where, even though I've had Greek and Hebrew, it's hard for me. Okay, there are guys who are writing stuff that is so technical and so advanced that you sit down and it's like walking in quicksand up to your waist. You know, you're just it's slow and it's tedious. And yeah, you know, I mean, there's good things in that. I have a commentary right now that I bought on Mark. It is highly, highly technical. Um, and, it, and, and you'd walk out on Sunday mornings if I started to get <laughs> more knowledge from it because you'd be like, what? And, um, but you get the idea. It's, there's just all these different layers. So you want to find a commentary that is going to kind of meet you on that level. If the commentaries you're finding are, are too shallow, then you need to dig a little deeper, go a little further, so that you get something that's not over your head and not too far below you. So it's kind of like right in that sweet spot. There's not too many bookstores where you can go peruse them, Matthew. So. No, but the one advantage um, with the internet is that you can go on the internet now and just Google best commentaries on the Gospel of Mark, and they'll give you the top five or the top 10, and they'll tell you why or what the strengths of those commentaries are. And if you read it and it says this is a highly technical commentary, then man, you probably, unless you're a really good Greek student, you should walk away from that one. And so, well, this one's more for, you know, lay leaders in the church. Well, okay, that's, that's great. And you can always email me. Anybody can email me, and I can, you know, help if I can um, and, and tell you what's, what's good and not. So we're very exhausted. Somebody left an ESV study Bible at my house. It's really nice, but it seems like every time I open it, the print gets smaller. And it's already, it's already this big. And I'm thinking, if I thought this in large print, I don't think I'd be able to carry it. So. <laughs> well, we do need readers. That's for sure. I have those too. And magnifying glasses. I have one of those in my office too. So if you're going to do a word study, um, some of the things that uh, are, are helpful for us, 
some of the things I think he starts off here in this section is, is be, be concerned about uh, some of the fallacies associated with word studies. And I don't know, how many of you do word studies on a fairly regular basis? Okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Most of you don't. <laughs> so that helps me because I don't want to spend too much time here on this. Um, but let's remember, again, the Bible's not originally written in English. So we have to be very careful that uh, we don't get so hooked on the English words that we, we miss the points. For instance, uh, he gives the illustration. For example, the Greek word parakalesis is translated in NIV with the following English words, comfort, encouragement, appeal, be encouraged, consolation, encouragement, encouraging message, exhortation, greatly encouraged, preaching, urgently. Those are a lot of different words. So a lot of different words like that, like comfort and exhortation, can mean different things depending on the context. The English only fallacy occurs when you base your word study on the English word rather than the underlying Greek or Hebrew word. Okay, So that's just kind of a, a basic thought. The other thing is you can spend too much time on the root of the word. Uh, I've done this myself. I've, I, you know, I'll confess. I've spent too much time on the root of a word um, at times. And uh, I hear preachers do this uh, fairly frequently. They, they do a great job of this. They say, Think about how silly this can be, even in English. Is a butterfly a fly that's lost control and crash landed into a tub of butter? Is a pineapple a certain kind of apple that only grows on pine trees? What in the world is a sawhorse? I mean, those are great. I mean, so you have to be careful with the etymology and uh, going too deeply into the root. Say, oh, I found this root, you know, this word, and I think this must mean this. Well, you've got to back off of that sometimes. It's not always the end all. Uh, time frame fallacy. You latch on to a late word meaning and read it back into the Bible. So the Apostle Paul, for instance, is going to um, uh, use the word uh, dynamis when he's talking about the, the power of the gospel in Romans chapter 1. When you think of anything that sounds like dynamite, you think of a big explosion and you think, wow, you know, this is the dynamite of God. I preach that. Uh, long time ago, but uh, you know, here it is. It, you know, it, it's dynamite, and but that's a new reference there. When Paul translated dynamis, he was talking about the power of the gospel, but he was talking about it in the framework of here's the power of the gospel, the power of the empty tomb, the resurrection of Christ. You see the power of the gospel, and you don't have dynamite until a whole long time after that, right? And so we can pick up on a late word uh, meaning and force it back into the text. Remember, we're trying to find out, well, what did the author intend by using that word? He certainly did not mean that the power of the gospel was like a ginormous explosion, you know? I'm thinking of a little western where they blow up a cave or something, you know? Kaboom! It's like, no, uh, it was really not in Paul's mind, okay? He really didn't see that one coming. So, overload, fallacy is another one. Um, it's basically the idea that a word will include all of those senses every time it's used. For instance, the word spring, the English word spring. It can refer to a season, a metal coil, an act of jumping, or a source of water. You would be overloading spring to assume that in every passage in which it occurs, the word carries not just one, but all of those senses. So you gotta be careful about that. And believe it or not, I've heard people teach and they go through every one of those English aspects, and it's, it's just not relative. Word count fallacy. Uh, you do a word study, and you think, okay, here's how it's meant to be in this context, and so you apply it to every other usage. And that's a mistake to do as well. And he goes on, he mentions the word ekklesia on the next page. But ekklesia is the word, the Greek word for what? For church. Okay? And you know that it's used over 100 and, or 115 times. The vast majority, something like 110, 112 times, depending on a couple of variances with a couple of these words, it refers to the local church. There's a handful of times it does not refer to the local church, it refers to what? The universal church of the body of Christ. You could definitely say, well, okay, I'm finding that the word church is always the local church, you can apply it to the local church in every instance. That would be definitely a word count fallacy. 
word concept fallacy, uh, where you study one word like ecclesia and say, well, that's church, and then you limit the whole scope of the church to that one word versus body of Christ, universal church, all the different household faith and different terms that could be used for it. And then selective evidence fallacy. Uh, we just cite the evidence that supports our favorite interpretation. Okay? And we kind of lean that way, you know, pretty, pretty hard. So choosing our words um, is, is huge. We need to figure out, as we do word studies, which are the words that we should be looking at carefully. And he gives us uh, four guidelines there. <clears throat> Look for words that are crucial to the passage. Uh, things that are really significant, you have to understand it in order to grasp the meaning that the author intends. Uh, also look for repeated words. Um, if they're repeated, uh, pay close attention to them. Look for figures of speech. Those are words that are not meant to be taken in a literal sense. And look for words that are unclear. I like to look at difficult words. <coughs> Especially words that I don't know what they mean, you know. Especially if I'm digging through a passage and I don't really don't know what this passage means. Uh, I'm going to probably, you know, delve into some of those words more deeply so that I understand uh, basically, you know, what exactly is is going on. Not every passage you come across is going to demand that you do a significant word study. Not everyone will, but some will, and then you'll want to delve into it and check it out. Determine what the word could mean. As we go through and we think of um, a word study, we have to figure out what is the semantic range? What are our choices? And this is where the English and the Greek, for instance, don't line up very well. And he gives the illustration here of um, the semantic range, and he talks about, you know, there's a whole range of words, and he uses the word hand. Do you see that there? That, that's great. It's the terminal part of a vertebrae forelimb. It's my right hand. A personal possession. It fell into the hands of the enemy. A side, on the one hand or on the other hand. A pledge. I give you my hand in marriage. A style of penmanship. This letter was written in my own hand. A skill or ability. She tried her hand at sailing. A unit of measure. The horse is 15 hands high. You get the idea, right? I mean, it's like, whoa, there is a huge semantic range. A huge semantic range. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with the right word choice, right? So word choice is absolutely imperative when you're doing a word study. Even if you're, um, even if you're a Greek student, if you're a Greek student and uh, you take, um, uh, you know, a word um, uh, like agape and you look at it and you say, well, here's my choices. I have four possible choices. Part of Greek exegesis was coming down to that choice and really the word choice will hinge on how your finished product is presented. In other words, there can be a very wide range. He gives the illustration here of the word entrust uh, in your notes there. And he says, okay, here's two possibilities. Here's two choices for English. Oh, but look at that. In Greek, there's five. That's where your problem runs in. See? You can have, you can have uh, the word in trust. And in English, we have one or two. That's pretty easy. In Greek, we have one, two, three, four, five. You can see why it's tricky, right? And if you're a Greek student, you're only going to pay attention to what? The Greek. You're, the English doesn't matter. You're going to try to come up with a word choice that's based upon the Greek. This is where, let me give you a little background. This is where there's a lot of um, forks in the road. And depending on your word choice, uh, as a theologian, you will come out a this or a that. All right? I was at a uh, pastor's conference 20 years ago now, and I, the, the pastor's conference that I went to, it's a well-known pastor's conference, and it was very big on teaching. So you went to these seminars, and you would sit in a seminar for an hour, hour and a half, 
and they would teach you their theological position. And I remember sitting there, and I, I walked in with the presupposition that this is not my theological position, but I'm, I'm willing to listen. I'm very interested in this, but it's just not where I am. And the professor, of, and he was a seminary prof, he was going through this, and he kept going, and I was like taking these copious notes, and I'm writing down, I agree with that, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, that's a good point there, oh yeah, I think we're more alike all the time, and he came down to this one word, I won't tell you what it is, I don't want you to be hyped up, um, and he went that way, and I went that way, and, and to this day, theologically, he is here, and I am here, now, I have a lot of respect for people that study the scripture like that, and we just come to a difference of opinion on a word choice. Because I could be wrong, and this is where anytime you do a theological study, you do a word study or whatever it is, you have to have some level of humility and acknowledge that you might not be correct. People drive me crazy when they're 100% dogmatic. I know this is, you know, if it says in the Bible, that's, that's one thing. And we can be very dogmatic on many, many things. And we should. We should have convictions on many, many things. So the society that we live in today is all willy-nilly, and it's just like, well, anything goes, you know, and it's like, it just drives me crazy. There are things that are gray that we, that we have some differences on or potentially can have some differences on. And my brother went to the left side of the fork of the road, and I went to the right side, and uh, I walked out of there enlightened. But I also walked out, like I say, with a great measure of respect because of his level of study. Where I get driven crazy is by theologians who will not honestly approach this and do all of the diligence and show me their word choice. Instead, I get things like, oh, yeah, but, and they just kind of suck whatever it is out of the air and say, well, this is what I believe. It's like, you have no basis for it. What do you do with this? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. That gives me a headache. I don't want to deal with this. I don't. And, and it, it's so irresponsible. It, it really is. And uh, so much of that today is going on. Really, so much of it is going on. But your word choice is going to be critical. It's going to be critical. So you say to yourself, well, kind of, I'm not a Greek student. How do I come up with this? What you're going to look for is um, overlaps, for instance. You might find that there's an overlap. This English word, the way it's used, is predominant here, and this here uh, overlaps that. And so you can come to some key understandings with regard to that. And I think that that is, is very helpful for you. Another way that you're able to use a tool that's uh, available to you, and you have this on page 173 in third edition, and 142 in second edition, and it's basically an illustration of an NIV um, exhaustive concordance. And when you look at the concordance that has, for instance, a Strong's concordance would do this. You have the illustration of the word press. So the word press here in the English do you see there, right next to it, it gives you the number 12? So you have 12, that's 12 times it's used, and it gives you all the usages of that word press. So that's why your Strong's Concordance is four inches thick. It's got every blooming word there is. And you can look all the way through and see how they're used. And you see the four digits, the numbers to the right column? Those four numbers are going to reflect what the original word is. And you're going to go back to it, and you're going to look it up. Now, the illustration here is the usage of number 1503. Oh! Bless you. 1503, and you see that that is what Paul uses in Philippians 3.12. But I press on to take hold of that. Okay? High calling, so forth. 1503, what is that Greek word? What is that Greek word? When you go back to 1503... And you see what the Greek word is, and then you see that that Greek word, and you see the number to the right of that Greek word, the 1503, that's 45. So in the English, the word press is translated in whatever version. If this is the NIV Exhaustive Concordance, it's the NIV Bible, it's used 12 times in the NIV Bible. When you look it up, though, you see that in the whole of the New Testament, it's used 45 times. 
Okay. Is everybody with me? All right. Those are that's what those numbers mean. So it's 1503, and you see Diaco is used 45 times, and here's how it's used. It is translated pursue, persecute, systematically oppress, harass a person or a group. It's extended meaning of pursuing a person on foot in a chase. Also from the image of the chase comes the meaning of striving and pressing on to a goal with intensity. Now, given the context of Philippians 3.12, which one of those meanings would you think would be the best? Pursuing a person on foot in a chase? No, no. Probably striving and pressing on to a goal with intensity, right? But what is going to be the final, final verdict? What's going to be the final point to establish what it is? Context. The context. The context, exactly. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter. Look up 1 Peter chapter 5. chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Read verses 1 through 5 and look for a repeated word. Look for a word of significance. Shepherd pops up. Elders. Elders pops up. Anything else? Submission. Okay. You definitely have a section here that is going to mention these, these leaders, evidently in the church, uh, and referencing them as elders or shepherds. You have the example, for instance, of the chief shepherd, who is Jesus Christ. You have all these things going on. I want to ask you this question. In verse 5, it says to be subject to your elders. What is exactly meant by the term elders in verse 5? Who are those elders? Church leadership. Pardon? Church leadership. Church leadership. All right. That's one possibility. <clears throat> Older people versus younger people. Okay. That's another possibility. Are there any other possibilities? Spiritually mature. Spiritually mature people versus immature people. That's another possibility. I was saying the elder. Depends which version you use. It doesn't say the elders in the New American Standard. You're subject to And your is an italics, which means it was added for readability. Exactly. When he says in verse 1, I exhort the elders among you, is he talking about older people or spiritually mature people, or is he talking about the office of elder? I exhort the elders among you as your what? Fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, the witnesses of the sufferings of Christ, he's in a backwards way. I think he's elevating himself because he's truly the apostle here. But he's the partaker also the glory that's to be revealed. Shepherd the flock. He's exhorting the elders to shepherd the flock. All right? You see that? That's the action. That's the verbiage that you see. Elders that are supposed to shepherd the flock. We have three possibilities. Spiritually mature. 
Does that fit? You might be able to stretch it. Younger versus older? No. Office of elder? Call upon to be a shepherd? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, elders that are earthly elders uh, holding the office of elder are under the authority of the chief elder, the chief shepherd, uh, which is Jesus Christ. So he's talking here that we're supposed to, as elders, shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntary, according to the will of God, and not for sort of gain, but with eagerness. This is all pertaining to the office of elder. All right? So that's, a, that's an important point. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. All right? So there's a, a special crown of glory that for those elders who rule well. As I would understand it. He then turns and he says, You younger men, you younger men, likewise, likewise to whom? To likewise, he says, there's a responsibility here. Be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The context there would seem to indicate that the elders in verse 5 may be different than the elders in verse 1. So, so my translation has, has a different way of describing that verse. And so to me, that would be a good case then to go back and look at the root word to see if it's the same word. Right, right. And oftentimes it is. I mean, um, it's probably presbyteros. Um, I, I, I would tend to, to think that that's true. If they're the same word, what is going to come down to your choice? How are you going to make the determination on the choice? The context, exactly. And because he says younger men, it would seem that the context, younger men and older men, are what's in view there, versus younger men and the elder who is an elder in the church, an officer in the church. Now that's, it's just a, one of those examples that you can see where your word choices definitely has an impact, doesn't it? And how you teach that is going to depend on which way you go, left or right. All right, so in a case, I think it is, it, we heard a message this summer when we were on vacation and the pastor, uh, he's a very great uh, Bible teacher and preacher. And he developed that in his development, and his choice was that these elders are older people to be contrasted with the younger people. And he said that is where that context is, and that's how he fleshed it out, and that's the direction he went. And he made this phenomenal application based upon his understanding of it and that direction of his word choice. Had he used the other possibility as a word choice, he would not have made that uh, application. But that's where it is so important. If we want to benefit from the power of the Word of God, we want to be able to understand the meaning of that scripture, right? And, and give that meaning because that's where the Holy Spirit is going to really do a work. If we make that wrong word choice and it's not what the author intended, then we miss the power of that passage. Does that make sense? It may be that, remember the, the, the whole journey with the interpretive journey? Part of that is that in number four, before we do the application uh, with the fifth step, the fourth step was consult the biblical map, right? So we're going to look at the biblical map, and we're going to say, okay, so you could consult the biblical map. You could go either way with the elder thing, couldn't you? You could go either way. You could take left or right, and you would consult the biblical map, and you could be you know, fine, there, there's not a heresy involved, all right? But by choosing the wrong application there, the wrong word choice, you will find that your weightiness of your lesson will be less impactful, if that makes sense. And I would offer, I, 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 one of those chapters we're not gonna get to is dealing with the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this, 
But I would submit to you that the pastor who preached that message back in May, when I heard it, was right on point with the word choice that he made because it has stuck in my heart and mind <coughs> since then. Okay? And I believe that it is the role of the Holy Spirit of God to take that and, and do that. And had he made the wrong decision, again, it wouldn't be heresy. There'd be people going, well, I don't know if that's what I believe. And that's always the case, right? I mean, that's when you sit down and go, like, I don't know. And, and again, we can respectfully disagree, provided we put the time and effort into trying to figure it out honestly, all right? That's fine. But one of the keys is, what is the Holy Spirit doing with the Word of God? And uh, he uses the Word of God. And that's why we want to be diligent about trying to find the true meaning of things, especially if we're instructing others uh, in the Word of God. All right, questions? Anybody have a question, thoughts? I have a, a tool at home that's called the Keyword Bible. It's a new King James, and it has uh, these important references right by each word. Yeah. It kind of pre-selects what are the important words, so you might right. not agree or disagree. But it gets back to the strong definition of what that word is in either Greek or Hebrew. Yeah. And it's very helpful because it's right in the text. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a lot of those types of Bibles. I, I go back to the, does anybody remember the Thompson Chain yeah. Bibles? Yeah. The, the little reference Bibles where you could go and you could just follow through and you could look through. There's been a lot of awesome uh, tools that have been developed. And especially in the computer age, there's just a lot of different things. BibleGateway.com. If you don't go to BibleGateway.com, um, you're missing out. Bible Gateway is, is fantastic. Um, I remember, I remember going to a, uh, a breakfast that they had for pastors because they came out with a new Bible version, and it was called God's Word. You can go to Bible Gateway. I don't know if you can even buy God's Word anymore. Man, that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you could go to that Bible Gateway, and you could look up you know, favorite passages, and you could check those out and just read it. Um, God's Word is... A, is one of the strangest translations that I've ever read. Um, I gave it to Karen. She read the cover off the thing. It just kind of started to evaporate after a while. But it is not a dynamic equivalent. It, it is a, it's a word for word. But the way they put it together and the way they float, I'm not sure that that's not the best thing I've ever seen. But it just never really took off. So, uh, but you can go on those kind of websites like Bible Gateway. If you think of a Bible verse, for instance, and you don't know where it is, Boom, there you go. You'll, you'll get it right away. And sometimes you can Google it. You can just Google, you know, uh, you know, a little snippet from a verse of scripture. Just type it in and, and your Google, boom, it'll pop it right up. It's just amazing. Bible Gateway will be the first one. choice. Bible Gateway is excellent. Bible Gateway will give you the options because you click on, you can get the whole context. And it'll give you, here's the context. Or if you want full chapter, boom, full chapter. So you can do that very easily too. And you can compare the different ones by just clicking on the different versions. So if you want a more formal version, you go to New American Standard, for instance, you look at it here, and you say, I wonder what the message says. And you go, whoa, okay. Uh, you know, but you can check out a lot of different things. So, and there's more versions than you can shake a stick at. They keep adding more on Bible Gateway. They're coming up with things I never even heard of. It's like, oh, okay. And they have commentaries on it too. Yeah, they do, yeah. Blue Letter Bible as well. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of different things. A lot of, lot of lousy things out there too, though. And uh, I mean, I've, I've gone online. If you just are looking for an explanation of a passage, be careful because you can go on and you can find some wacky interpretations. So, and especially as you go through this interpretive journey, you're not going to be satisfied with those wacky interpretations. You're really not. You're going to look at it and say, "Oh, there's something wrong with this." Now, let me give you my plug. The next two lessons, if you said, Kevin, you can only teach two lessons from grasping God's word, which two lessons would they be? They're the next two weeks. So don't miss the next two weeks. Uh, it deals with meaning uh, and, and who. So we, we have it next week. So And then we're off a week for VBS because the, all the tables will be used. So if you want to sit cross-legged around four, I guess we can do that, but um, we won't have it that week. It'll be the week after uh, that we'll be doing it, and then there's one more after that. But uh, so after tonight, we have three more weeks. The next two, though, the next two lessons are the 
that's just as good as it gets. I mean, good stuff. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for our time together tonight. Uh, bless us, Lord, as we desire to know uh, the meaning of Scripture and uh, how to arrive at that meaning, Lord. Give us wisdom as uh, we, we seek to be true followers of, of you and your word. Bless each one, Lord, uh, for coming out tonight, and just give us a, a great remainder of the week. May we honor and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.